Okay, so this lecture today is going to be connected to the anatomy lecture that we covered last week. So we're going to be covering biomechanics of resistance training. Now, a quick recap. Remember, different joints do different types of movement. So for example, the elbow does flexion and extension. That's uh, flexion and then extension. The shoulder is a joint that's capable of a lot of different movements, so it can still do flexion and extension, but it can also do adduction, abduction, so abduction going away, um, abduction coming in, um, internal rotation, external rotation, horizontal adduction, so that is actually the one I just showed, um, and abduction. Your trunk or your torso is capable of flexion and extension and also of lateral flexion. Your hip is another joint that's capable of a lot of movement, so flexion, extension, same deal as the shoulder, uh, adduction and abduction, it can internally rotate and externally rotate, horizontally adduct and abduct. And the knee does flexion and an extension, and if you remember, different there's different, um, different muscle actions, there's concentric muscle actions and then there's eccentric muscle actions. Concentric muscle actions are when, when muscle is shortened um, and overcome a resistance. And eccentric is when it lengthens and a resistance is lowered. Um, also, if you remember, the muscle is composed of a variety of smaller structures going all the way down to the sarcomere, which is composed of uh, actin and myosin, which is the most basic contractile unit of the muscle. Um, these muscles, these muscles work when an action potential comes down from a motor neuron um, into that actual muscle fiber, and then that muscle contracts. And then if you remember, there's different types of muscles, so that you had the slow twitch, and then you had your fast twitch muscle fibers, um, and then the slow twitch muscle fibers are recruited more quickly than the fast twitch muscle fibers. So um, if we were lifting a light load, we wouldn't be recruiting um, those high threshold uh, fast twitch type 2 muscle fibers. So we have what causes a muscle action. It's that, that electrical stimulus that comes from that motor... Uh, motor neuron down to the actual muscle fiber. So when this person is actually doing curls, they're recruiting muscle fibers, and presumably if he kept on curling the same exact weight, um, fatigue would set in, and then in order to maintain force output, he would have to start recruiting more and more muscle fibers. Um, so this is movement. So again, we have an elbow doing flexion and then extension, okay? Um, and then if, again, if we look at it, the individual muscle fibers, they're contracting. There's a concentric contraction right here and an eccentric contraction. And now movements happen in specific planes. So there's a transverse plane, there's a frontal plane, and then there's a sagittal plane of movement. And I'll get into this right now, but most strength training movements occur in the sagittal plane. So this movement is occurring in the sagittal plane right now. So again, if you really just break it down, we just have movement that happens because of an electrical impulse going to the muscle fibers. So that's why it happens. How does it happen? It happens flexion and extension at the elbows. And then what plane is it happening in? And then also what's changing in the muscles as we actually do it? So if I, if I go back to this, I can't exactly pause this GIF, but you'll notice that joint angles actually change as this person is going through the range of motion on this exercise. Okay, so when his arms are totally straight, there's not really any stress on his biceps. But as he starts to come up, his um, it's going to be called your external moment arm. So if we look at this right here, we have um, where the joint action is taking place. So that's specifically um, right at the elbow, where the resistive load actually is. So when it's at 90 degrees, it's all the way out here. And as we lower it and then raise it up, moment arms, so you're going to get more of a definition of this, but that's an external moment arm. That's actually going to change throughout the course of the range of motion. So if you look at um, the M on this slide, that represents something called an external moment arm. And now the bigger external moment arms, the more um, force the muscle needs to produce to actually overcome this load. So what we see is as somebody's lifting, external moment arms get smaller or they actually get bigger, bigger, bigger in this case, and then smaller, 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 and then back to bigger. 
and then smaller. We'll get into more of this in a second, but just know that that's, that's a, already a basic introduction to biomechanics is understanding um, how moment arms change throughout the course of a lift. So again, there's different muscular contractions. So let's say someone's doing a curl and they're doing a concentric contraction. The muscle shortens. When they do the curl, the, muscle fo the force that the muscle produces needs to actually overcome the, the force of that load. The force of the load times an external moment arm, which is the forearm. And uh, we'll get into that again. I'm actually kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but that's called torque. Uh, so basically, because joint angles change throughout the course of a range of motion, the amount of force that a muscle produces also is going to be changing. Also, depending on resting muscle length, the muscle can produce either more or less force. So there's an optimal length where a muscle can produce the most force. And if I actually go back all the way back to this. So again, if we look at actin and myosin, those, those overlap each other as muscles contract, and that actually affects force output. So as a muscle gets uh, longer or shorter, depending on the type of contraction that happens, um, you can you actually have the potential to produce more or less force. So again, I'm going to get into more of this. We haven't even gotten to the objectives yet. Um, but basically what I, what I just described, and I'll get into more of it, was, was torque. Okay, And that's going to be probably the more important part of this lecture is getting that down. Okay, so movement, right, what we're going to cover today, which I already briefly went over, is movement planes, force and units of measurement, levers and mechanical advantages, and then also torque. Which, which is part of levers and mechanical advantages. It's, it's actually probably a more important part for your understanding. Okay, so biomechanics and anatomy. In designing an exercise program for performance enhancement and injury prevention, you must understand human anatomy from a functional perspective and be able to apply biomechanical principles to meet client goals. So, if you understand biomechanics, you're going to understand technique and why good technique is important. Um, you'll, you'll understand that with poor technique, you're putting undue stress on the body. So either one, you're going to make the muscles work harder than they need to in, in compromised positions, or you're going to put the muscle in a compromised position where things like your ligaments um, or tendons are going to be taking on more of the load, or you could be causing um, um, issues to add your actual bony structure. So functional anatomy is the study of how body systems cooperate to perform certain tasks. To design effective exercise interventions, it's necessary to know which muscles are active during which activities and match them with appropriate exercises. So that is really just pairing um, one principle that we'll learn about later, specificity, uh, with exercise selection. And biomechanics, again, this is what we're going to be going over today. Biomechanics... It's a field of study that applies mechanical principles to understanding the function of living organisms and systems. So we're really just looking at movement mechanics. Okay, so biomechanics is physics, or mechanics is physics, and biomechanics is really how does, how does that work in your body. So we'll cover mechanical terminology and also principles. So first, kinetics, what's kinetics? Kinetics is movement assessment with respect to specific forces that are involved. So again, movement occurs in, in what's called anatomical planes. So right here, the transverse, the frontal, and the sagittal plane are anatomical planes. So these are the three planes that movement actually occurs in, okay? Now, when I'm doing an exercise in the uh, exercises in the sagittal plane, again, a lot of resistance training exercises are going to be in the sagittal plane. Um, we're thinking of exercises that involve things like flexion and extension. Um, so, for example, squats involve flexion and extension, knee flexion, hip flexion, knee extension, hip extension. Um, exercises that involve flexion of the shoulder or extension of the shoulder, exercises that involve flexion um, of the elbow, so bicep curls, for example. Um, in the frontal plane, we have anything that involves um, abduction and adduction. 
So you might think lateral raises. And then to the transverse plane, just think rotation. So for example, if I was doing, uh, if I'm golfing and I'm involving rotation of my torso, that's the transverse plane. Um, in terms of being in the weight room, you might think more of, uh, of like a medicine ball rotation. Okay, forces in unit of measurement. So I wrote down power here. Um, I wrote down velocity, distance. Now, these are things I'm not, they do matter. I'm going to talk more about force and then also torque today. So force, I'm not going to quiz you on what force is actually measured in. But force is measured in newtons. And But then we have this distance component, which these two things together um, contribute to torque. Okay, so that's that's measured in newton meters. Now, I think a lot of people might think that uh, think in terms of how much force do I need to produce to overcome um, some kind of load or or to um, uh, to lift a weight. But in reality, they should be thinking about torque. And if you've spent any time in resistance training, um, you'll notice that your movement can be more more or less efficient depending on things like the distance um, that the load is from where your muscles are actually acting. Um, so what I mean by that is imagine if you were doing um, a Romanian deadlift and let's say you had it with a kettlebell and you could either put the kettlebell in between your legs or actually behind your legs when you did the um, end part of the motion or if you just kept it hovering out in front of you the whole entire time. Um, it's really the same exercise but the distance between where the, the load actually is and where you're doing your um, your range of motion affects how much force your muscles need to produce to overcome that load. And you'll actually see a video example of that later. So force is a mechanical action or effect applied to a body that tends to produce acceleration and it's from outside the body. So um, when we think about force, there's internal forces and then there's going to be external forces. So internal forces, um, they act inside the body. So what, what force is your muscle producing? Um, and then when you also think about your tendons and ligaments, those also contribute to um, what's called passive force production. Muscles do active force production. Tendons do. Um, tendons and ligaments are more passive. Um, and then also external forces. So those would include gravity, friction. Um, and then specifically for what we're talking about is, is resistance. So what we're really looking at is what's the difference between um, the external force and then the forces that my body is producing. The effect of force in producing, controlling, or altering movement depends on four things. Magnitude, which is how much force is, is produced or applied. Um, location, where on a body or structure the force is being applied. And then direction. And that's where force is directed, sorry, duration. So how long is force actually being um, applied? Now, to cause movement or generate force against external objects, both ends of each skeletal muscle must be attached to bone by connective tissue. Most body movements involve that action of more than one muscle group. So oftentimes when you're doing an exercise, it's not just one muscle group working. The muscle most directly involved in bringing about a movement is called a prime mover or an agonist. So if I was doing a bicep curl, um, my prime mover is my bicep. Um, if I was doing a leg extension, my, my prime mover or my agonist is my quadricep. And a muscle that can slow down or stop the movement is called an antagonist. So um, if I was doing a curl, my uh, again, my agonist is my bicep. My antagonist is my tricep. And a muscle is called a synergist when it assists directly in a movement. So if I was doing a bench press, my prime movers or my agonist is going to be my, my pectoralis major, my chest. But a synergist is going to be my tricep. So my tricep is helping me with that range of motion. So usually, generally speaking, depending on what you're doing, a muscle is going to be one of those three things. Okay, this is this will get into more of what I was explaining in the beginning. So we're going to do levers and mechanical advantages, and then also um, that's going to lead into something that's more important, which is going to be torque. Okay. 
So these are some definitions that are going to be important to understand, and I'll be I'll be showing you what this actually looks like too. So in order to understand how the body affects movement, a basic knowledge of levers is required. Um, some basic definitions include one lever. So a lever is a rigid or semi-rigid body that when subjected to a force whose line of action does not pass through its pivot point exerts force on any object impeding its tendency to rotate. Now fulcrum is the pivot point of a lever. Moment arms, this is going to be important for torque, a moment arm is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the fulcrum. I'll show you an image of this so you understand what it looks like. The line of action of force is an infinitely long line passing through the point of application of the force orientated in the direction in which the force is exerted. Now torque is the degree to which a force tends to rotate an object about a specified fulcrum. It's defined as the magnitude of force times the length of its moment arm. And now there's two different types of force, and I've already kind of said this when I've said internal and external. So muscular force, think internal. It's the force generated by biochemical activity or the stretching of non-contractile tissue. So that's when I said there's passive and active uh, ways to produce force that tend to draw the opposite ends of a muscle towards each other. So if I'm producing force uh, as I'm doing a curl, I'm bringing the ends of my muscle towards each other because it's shortening. And then resistive force is force generated by a source external to the body that acts contrary to the muscle force. Don't worry if it's if it's confusing. It might I'm sure it's confusing right now. I, would, <clears throat> I always thought biomechanics was really confusing until I understood it from a resistance training perspective. And I haven't even shown you all um, any resistance training images yet. So uh, bear with me for right now. Now. This is going to be important for, for how much force a muscle actually needs to produce. So it, it's called a mechanical advantage, and it's the ratio of the moment arm through which an applied force acts to that through which a resistive force acts. Mechanical advantage greater than 1 allows the applied force to be less than the resistive force produce, to produce an equal amount of torque. So just to um, uh, break this down for a second, anytime I'm doing any kind of resistance training motion, anything, or actually anytime I'm doing any motion because gravity is a force that works on your body. Anytime I'm doing any motion, um, let's say I wanted to do a push up, okay? My muscular force that I'm producing needs to overcome the load, which in this case is going to be me. So no matter what, there's always that interaction between um, what force is being applied to me and what force I'm applying back out, okay? Um, external forces can change if you if you add load. Um, other things that can change are, are like lever links, <clears throat> or, or in this case when I talked about moment arms. Um, and I'll get more into moment arms in a second. We'll get more into levers. Now, I, I'm probably never going to quiz you on, on levers, but if you're taking um, an actual NSCA, CSCS class, it's probably going to be on there. Um, I'm going to talk about levers because it's it discusses mechanical advantages. So there's three different kinds of levers. I'll show you images of this too. So first class lever is a lever for which the muscle force and resistive force act on the opposite sides of a fulcrum. Second class lever is a lever for which the muscle force and resistive force act on the same side of the fulcrum, with the muscle force acting through a moment arm longer than that through which the resistive force acts. <coughs> so second class levers are actually a mechanical advantage because internal moment arms are greater than external moment arms. You'll see a picture of this soon. So this is, so for example, when the calf muscles work to raise the body onto the balls of the feet, um, it actually has a mechanical advantage. So this is one case um, where the force that your muscles need to produce is going to be smaller smaller than the resistive force. So most of the time, if I, if I was curling 20 pounds, my muscles need to produce considerably more than 20 pounds to actually lift that weight um, because 
my bicep or my elbow joint is acting at a mechanical disadvantage. Okay, we're almost there. So a third class lever is a lever for which the muscle force and resistive force act on the same side of the fulcrum with the muscle force acting through a moment arm shorter than through which the resistive force acts. Mechanical advantage is less than one, so the muscle force has to be greater than the resistive force to produce torque equal to that produced by the resistive force. So here's an example of, of, of different classes of levers um, along with where resistance would be applied um, and then also where the fulcrum is. So let's actually ignore um, our, our first class lever because um, you really don't see that. But the, the calf would be an example of a second class lever um, and then something like a curl would be an example of a third class lever. So again, that's the fulcrum. This is where the resistance is coming from. That's where the effort is coming from. Fulcrum, resistance is pulling down. Effort's going up. Okay, so now let's take a look at this. Can everyone see uh, where it says MR? Look at where it says MR on, on this calf, which again is the second class lever. And look at where it says MM. MR is the moment arm of the resistance. So if I was holding weights in my hand and doing calf raises, the weight is the external force, okay? Now, if you look at my muscle moment arm, MM, that's the distance between the muscle belly to where that external force actually is. That is actually bigger than the resistive moment arm, okay? Because my resistive moment arm is smaller than my muscle moment arm, my muscles actually need to produce um, less force than the resistance to overcome the load. Okay. Now compare this to something like a bicep curl, where you can see MR. So MR, that's my muscle, and there, and there's a lot of different terminology. I think the easiest thing to just call it is an external moment arm. But my MR is the is just the moment arm of the resistance. Uh, external moment arm. Now, look at how much bigger that is than the muscle moment arm. So here's my small little muscle moment arm where it says MM, and then there's my big external moment arm where uh, where it says MR. So this is all probably thoroughly confusing right now. So I want to give you guys some comprehension questions right now. So. Let's say, I'm going to actually write this down, home, new slide. Think of two sides of this equation. On one side, I have the force, my, I'm just actually just going to call it muscular force, times muscle moment arm on one side of the equation. And then on the other side of the equation, let's just say needs to be, in order for movement, concentric movements to happen, the muscular force that I produce times my muscle moment arm needs to be greater than external force, which is the load, times external moment arm. Now, again, muscular force is measured in newtons, but let's just, let's just for example, if we keep them on both sides of the equation, um, it's going to be fine, so we'll use pounds. So let's say that um, we don't know how much muscular force I need to produce, so we're just going to call that X times, we're going to say muscle moment arm. Let's just say our muscle moment arm is, is 1. So let's just say it's, it's 1. It needs to be greater than an external force. Let's say I'm trying to lift 30 pounds. So I want to know how much force I need to produce to keep that moving. So we're going to say 30 times... And we know that my external moment arm around the curl, let's just say we know that it's 10. Okay. So in order for um, my, my movement to actually happen or to continue to happen, how much force would my bicep actually need to produce to overcome that load? So um, again, I'm, I'm sure that this it might be a little bit confusing, but look at the equation. And then tell me what you think. Feel free to, I want you to actually type it in.
What do we think? I'm trying to lift 30 pounds. If I start out right here, and I know that my external moment arm is 10, and I know that my muscle moment arm is a lot smaller at 1, how much force does my muscle need to produce to overcome that 30 pounds? How many pounds of force? We'll just say. Yeah, muscular force, yep, needs to be greater than 300. Yep. Yep. Yep, great. Now let's take that same equation, and let's say that my, uh, my I'm doing calf raises now, okay? And calf raises are, are a different kind of exercise because the moment arm, um, the muscle moment arm is actually bigger. So this means that, um, no, not, not necessarily. Uh, the question was, so does this mean that type through levers are not great for force production? Um, so you're not the, so much of what happens in our body. Um, anytime I'm lift, if I'm lifting 500 pounds off the ground, my body needs to produce way more than 500 pounds of force to actually do that. So the question is not, are we not great at producing force? It's that, it's that we're at a mechanical disadvantage for a lot of things that we do. Um, so is a type three lever not good for, let, let me, let me show you this calf raise one. And then, and then I think you might get uh, a better example. I, what the real question is, is they're at a mechanical disadvantage. So they're great at producing force, but they just need to produce more force to get the job done. Okay. So I'm going to write this down. I changed the uh, moment arm, the muscle moment arm, to uh, 2, okay? And now let's change the external moment arm to 1. And again, let's just say we're doing a calf raise. Our muscle moment arm is 2. Our external moment arm is 1. We're still trying to move 30 pounds. How much force do we need to produce to get that moving? How much more than, than what? Yeah, great work. So, uh, Gritty, to, to really answer that question, it's we need to, what's at a mechanical advantage and what's at a mechanical disadvantage? Uh, so uh, doing a bicep curl, you're at, you're at a pretty big mechanical disadvantage. So that's just that ratio between the external moment arm um, to that internal moment arm. So that, that's a pretty big mechanical disadvantage, which mean, doesn't mean your muscle is not good at producing force. Just means it needs to produce more um, to overcome that actual resistive load. Um, and then, in terms of a calf raise, you're at a mechanical advantage. This is really one of the only uh, um, circumstances where you're actually going to be at a mechanical disadvantage. Oftentimes, you're you're acting at a mechanical disadvantage. Um, one thing that you can do in terms of technique with an exercise is make sure you're not putting yourself at more of a mechanical disadvantage. Okay. Um, so things like that. So type two levers are the most efficient for force. No, so we're not, uh, we're not necessarily talking about force production. So again, if you just think of this equation, it's not, it's not really necessarily an efficiency thing. Most efficient for force production. They don't have to produce as much force to move the same load. Because, I guess we could say use efficiency. So they don't have to produce as much force to move the same load. Um, they're all still good at producing force, just depending on that. Um, it would be like, imagine that you are on, um, let's see this. Do I have a teeter-totter graphic? Insert. I'm going to, bear with me, I'm going to try my best to draw a teeter-totter. So let's say you have a fulcrum right here. And shapes. And let's just do that. So let's say you have this, 
insert. text box okay there we Oh, whoops, I didn't want to do that. So this would be this would be pretty balanced, okay? Because the moment arms on each side are, are the same. So it's one to one, so it's not necessarily gonna move. But what would happen if let's see if we can just do this. If I if I move this in, what would happen? Actually, this is going to be a better example. Let's not move this in. Who's going who's going up? This side or that side? Right side going up or left side going up? Let's say you got two kids, yeah, two kids, same exact weight. Right side's right side's gonna go up because because look here, this this moment arm is gonna be bigger. So for the same exact force, it's gonna produce movement. So right side's gonna end up going up. Okay. So that's just kind of an example of why an inter like a bigger internal moment arm is going to be favorable. Okay. And hopefully I'll get to give you guys better examples of, of this coming up soon. So again, most muscles operate at a mechanical disadvantage. Um, this is why internal muscle forces are often much greater than the forces exerted by the body um, by on external objects. So as we get into torque, we'll get into this more. So, kind of just just describe this. Let's say that um, let's think about internal moment arms, and let's think about if you were trying to uh, to screw in a bolt, um, and you had and you had a screwdriver or not a screwdriver. Wow, I'm really showing I don't know how to use tools. So let's say that you were trying to to screw in a screw, and you had a wrench. Where would you hold that wrench? Would you hold it all the way at the end or would you hold it really close to where the pivot point is? Where would you want to hold it if you want to get the most bang for your buck? At the end or close to the pivot point? If I know this and I mess up my tools, you guys should know this. Where would you want to hold that? At the end or close to the pivot? Yeah, so we'd want to we'd want to hold it at the end because small. So it's if it's a large moment arm, we would need to produce less force. When I'm saying all of this, please uh, just remember this is think internal because the next one's going to be external. Um, so if I have a larger internal moment arm, I would need to produce less force. If I have a smaller internal moment arm, I would need to produce more force to do the same exact job. Okay, to get the same exact job done, moment arms are going to dictate how much for mo internal moment arms will dictate how much force you need to produce. So, um, torque is calculated, and we actually already did this. Torque is calculated by multiplying two factors together. Um, and I also noted that in reality, it's it's much much more complex than this. But um, for the most part, that's all you need to actually know. Um, it says I have poor internet connectivity. Everyone can still raise your hand if you can still hear me fine. If you can still hear me fine, just raise your hand because it said I, okay, great, good, thank you. Digital problems. That's great. Okay, good. So again, we just described this. We described length, 
Okay. Uh, if, if audio is cutting out a little bit, at the very least, I'm recording over all of this, so you will get a chance to look back at it. Okay. So I already gave you the example of length and force. Okay. So that was when I went up to right here. All this was was torque. That was torque. That was examples of length and force. So muscle force is, is the force, and then the length is the muscle moment arm. So length is just the distance from the force, from the pivot, and this is called the moment arm again. So that would be, this is the pivot point. The length is the moment arm. And the force, so force is exerted at right angles to produce um, angles to the moment arm to actually produce perpendicular force. Okay. So big internal moment arms are going to be good because it means you have you have to produce less force to do the same job. And now what about external moment arms? Where would be the easiest place to hold this? So you just did internal moment arms. Now we're on external moment arms. If, if you're trying to hold up a weight, where's the easiest place to hold it? Yeah, and what happens to, uh, what is happening to the moment arm um, in these images for this person? Is it getting bigger or, bigger or smaller? Yeah, so it's getting, it's getting bigger. So as external moment arms get bigger, your muscles need to produce more force to get the same exact job done. Okay? So now we have, we have moment arms on both sides of the equation. We have internal moment arm, we have external moment arms. If external moment arms get bigger, your muscles need to produce more force. If internal moment arms get bigger, your muscles can produce less force. Okay? So small external moment arms are beneficial for moving load, and big internal moment arms are beneficial for moving load. And just think, that's, that's really mechanical advantage or mechanical disadvantage. So if my bicep tendon, let me ask you this. Can you see where the tendon is? It says MM, and then we have um, our tendon right here. If my tendon attached right here, would I have to produce more or less force to move the same load? So if my tendon attach, yeah, good. Keep going. I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear some more answers. Yeah, exactly. Great. So if that got bigger, it'd be that. Now let's say that we took the same exact person, same same in, uh, attachment points and everything like that, but um, his, his arm, his arm right here was, um, let's just say his arm was six inches smaller than it is. Would how would that affect the amount of force he needs to produce to overcome that load? If his arm was six inches shorter, would he need to produce more or less force to overcome the load? What do we think? More or less force? Great. Less force. Good. Good. Okay, torque. So you all, um, you all actually have a great idea of what torque is right now. Um, so there's internal and external torque. So external torque is the torque that exists externally to the human body and is created by the human body acting on an object. Okay. Think of the external weight or load. 
The moment arm is calculated as the horizontal distance between the external load and the pivot point. So again, there it is right there, MR, that bottom part. Internal torque is the torque that exists internally to the human body and is created by the muscle or, again, the, those passive forces or elastic force exerted by stretched elastic structure acting upon the joint to which it's connected. So the force that's produced is the contraction, the contractile force exerted by the muscle. And the length of the moment arm is the distance between the effective center of the joint and the perpendicular distance from the line of pull of the muscle. So again, we have right here, we have our external force that we need to overcome. I just lose my PowerPoint. That's unfortunate. Can you all still hear me? Huh, just give me one second. Great connection, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Okay, I just reload. Uh, I just reloaded that. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Okay, my computer is not being cooperative. So anytime that you are trying to move a load, obviously you have the load. So what you're trying to move right here. Okay. And then the comparison between, am I really going back to the poor internet quality right now? Okay, hopefully this, is, this keeps working. But the comparison between this, this, uh, the, this external load, and then the external moment arm to my muscular moment arm and the force that my muscle produces will dictate whether or not um, movement actually happens. Okay, so um, let's take a look at this image. And this image is demonstrating changes in external moment arms at the knees as somebody does an actual squat. So what is happening at the external moment arm at the knee when somebody goes descends down into a squat in the eccentric portion is it getting uh bigger or is it getting smaller so let's write down our answers is the external moment arm getting bigger or smaller what do we think Yeah, what, uh, uh, what about at the hips too? At the hips, it doesn't show the arrow, but at the hips, is it getting bigger or smaller? Yeah, okay, so because all of that is getting bigger, do my muscles need to produce more or less force? As I'm coming out of, as I'm coming up, like where's actually a better question is, uh, where's the hardest part of the squat to actually overcome? Is it the top? Well, let's just say we have one, two, three, four pitchers um, from the left to the right. Let's just say, so what's the hardest part to overcome? Going from um, one to two, two to three or three to, I'm sorry, I'm messing this all up. If we call left to right, one, two, three, four, is the hardest part going from four to three, three to two, or two to one? I think I said that correctly this time. Yeah, great. 
So you gotta do the you gotta do the most work. Exactly. Okay. So now now let's take a look at this squat. So it's it's two different kinds of squats. Um, what you could probably imagine is is the difference between like a front squat and a low bar back squat. So let's call the one on the right a front squat, and we'll call the one on the left um, a low bar back squat. So based on these images right here, which one of these exercises has a smaller moment arm at the knee? The left or the right? Which one has a smaller moment arm at the knee? Smaller external moment arm. Which one has a smaller moment arm at the knee? Yeah, the one on the, the one on the left has a smaller external moment arm at the knee. Okay, so therefore, which one do you think puts more stress on the knee extensors? Left or right? So if we know the moment arm is bigger, if the moment arm is bigger, it's got to over over more to overcome. That specific muscle has more to overcome. Yeah. So it's going to be the right side. All right. You don't want to stay with me. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So which one puts more stress on um on on the torso? Okay, so the torso and the hips. Which which moment arm um, at the hips is bigger, the left or the right? Moment arm at the hips. Which one's bigger, the one on the left or on the right? Yeah, super good. Okay, now let's look at these. Um, Let's look at these, uh, the, this squat. So somebody is descending into the squat, and then they come, up, then they uh, they come out of the squat. So number number one, this one right here is going to be the same for everybody. But then you have another person that has good technique. They come right out of the squat. They rise up as one unit. But then you have another person who all the way over here, they get down to the bottom of the squat, and then instead of coming up as one unit, their hips shoot right up. So when this person's hips shoot right up, does the external moment arm um, at the hips get bigger or smaller compared to the one right next to it? Does it get bigger or smaller? Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll type it in, I'll type it in. All right, so I typed that in for you all to look at. Yep. 
Yeah. So the two, the yep. Uh, it's going to be the right side. So the right side, we're going to have a much bigger um, external moment arm at the hips. So again, look at the line of act. So this is right here. Is where the load. Oh, let me actually do it right here. So this is where the load is on that person. Uh, that's where the load is on that person. And then if we think of the distance between the hips moving over, so here to there, that, that's a certain amount of length. But now in this case, that length has become much further because the hips are shooting backwards. So that in turn is going to end up putting a lot more stress on the erectors, the low back, and also the hips. Okay. So this is something that I think is interesting, not anything that you'll necessarily need to, um, or probably won't be quizzed on that on this, but uh, whenever you're doing a movement or any kind of resisted movement, the only thing that stays consistent throughout the entirety of the range of motion is the load that you're using, so the force that you need to overcome. Now, remember, there's, what you, there's four things to think about. There's the... Um, the force you need to overcome, that's one. The external moment arm, that's two. Compared to the force that your muscle's producing, that's three. And your muscle's moment arm, that's four. So throughout the range of motion, external moment arms are constantly changing. Internal moment arms even change. Um, depending on joint angle. So here's an example of how uh, some subtle variations in, in the bicep moment arm um, as it changes. So actually when you're at 90 degrees, that moment arm is, is bigger compared to when you're right here. The other thing that also changes throughout um, the course of any range of motion of, of a muscle is how much force it can produce. Again, I showed you that length tension relationship image where if a muscle is maximally contracted, so for example, at the absolute top, um, then it can't actually produce um, as much force. So there's optimal lengths for force production. So I find that pretty interesting that throughout the course of a range of motion, the only variable in, in this torque equation that doesn't change is the external resistance. Um, but again, this is why something like technique is so important. So for example, imagine if somebody was bench pressing and instead of going uh, right to chest level, they accidentally went much, much lower on their body. Well, that's going to increase that um, external moment arm, and that's going to make it a lot harder for them um, to complete that at that lift. So that's what, that's one of the reasons why if you are if you are have skills and technique versus some let's say I had two people, one person was very skilled at a movement, they were economical in their movement compared to another person who was not, and technically speaking, they could produce the same amount of force the more skilled person is going to be able to move more load because they're, they're in control of their technique, specifically um, external moment arms. Um, you can also think about external moment arms as ways to modify uh, exercises to stress one muscle group or the other. So for example, if I was doing a trap bar deadlift and I let my hips drop down a lot more, can you see how in this image on the right, the knee is actually past the forearm? So he's going to be stressing his, his quads and specific uh, uh, on this image that more than on the left side, the left side is going to be working the hips and the erectors more. Um, and then this side, he's going to be working them less. Okay. So what are some implications? Bad technique can mean an increased external moment arm, increased ex uh, a bigger external moment arm just means um, extra stress in the body. Um, whereas good technique can mean reductions in external moment arms, which means for the same exact movement, you can you might be able to produce less force to do the same thing. Um, improvements in force improvements in force or improvements in technique then can increase the amount of weight that you can lift. So one thing I'll actually talk about at the end is how do we increase force production? What are the contributing factors to displays of strength? So the quiz that I put up doesn't have anything to do with contributing factors to displays of strength. So, and this is kind of just more of a neat thing. So at this point, if you can go on to the week two folder in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, so you're going to go to the week, I mean, not Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, just go to the week two folder. And what I want you to do 
is go to where it says quiz and click on that. Okay. So you're going to click on the quiz and you're, we're going to take, um, take that quiz and we'll discuss the answer. So similar to what we did in last class. So why don't you take five minutes to do that? Okay. I put up a very long write up of contributing factors to displays of strength, which only read if you're interested, but generally speaking, there are three, uh, three bins for contributing factors to displays of strength. Um, you have modifiable factors. Why do I have fatigue twice? I'm going to ignore that actually. And I also want to add this in. So some modifiable factors are, are muscle hypertrophy, neurological changes, and then technique. Temporary factors are fatigue. If you're fatigued, you cannot produce as much force. And then there's permanent factors, which um, there's specific genetics um, for strength and for muscle growth that some of us that some of us express better than others. Um, and then there's limb length, which technically is genetics too. So let's take somebody that has um, short arms versus somebody that has long arms. And they're both doing a deadlift. Who is that going to be easier for and why? Who can give a crack at that? If you want, you can just raise your hand, give me an answer. Who is it going to be easier for? Yeah, it's going to be easier for the long arm person. Yeah, exactly, because they start in a more mechanically advantageous position. Okay, how about this? Someone is bench pressing, and, um, and we have the same deal. We have a long arm person, and we have a short arm person. Who is the bench press going to favor, long arms or short arms? Yeah, it's going to favor short arms. And then what about what about you have a long leg person and a short leg person and they're doing a squat? Who's that going to favor? Long leg person or short leg person? Yeah, great. So that's, that's what we call anthropometrics. Yep. Yeah. All short. So then, then there's, there's uh, technical components too. So like, let's say I'll go to full slideshow. Whoops. I don't want to go from current slide. I don't want to go. Sorry about that. Okay, we have someone, let's say that she's doing this deadlift, right? And now let's say that she's doing the deadlift, but she's consistently having the bar go um, like three inches outside in front of her shins. Okay, so it, it's not touching her shins, it's in front. So it's like in front of where her toes are. Is that going to make the lift harder or easier? What else do we think? Harder or easier? Go ahead, type it in. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna make it harder. Why 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 is it gonna make it harder specifically? Yep, so Greedy had the answer. It's going to increase that moment arm at her hips, which means for the same exact load, she's going to need to produce more force to overcome it. So again, other things that change, and I kind of already already talked about this, but that, that just joint angles also change. 
your, your ability to express force. So that changes to, I also talked about how um, moment arms actually also change depending on joint angle. Um, and uh, so actually this is an example of muscle activity depending on joint angle. This is an example of the length of muscle moment arms throughout the course of hip extension and hip flexion. So that's, I think that that's pretty interesting that you have uh, these different hip extensors changing their muscle moment arm lengths throughout the course of range of motion. Um, so how else might you get, um, so we have ways to improve strength. One are, are things that contribute to strength. We've talked about limb lengths. I won't go too much into genetics, but there's some really interesting stuff out there on, um, on how especially like power athletes code positive for specific um, uh, variants of genes, so alleles on genes. Um, and then same with endurance athletes. So there's massive genetic components to what um, you actually can do. Um, so we talked about technique, um, fatigue. Fatigue can have a, actually a, a number of different influences. One, if you're tired, your, your technique might break down um, and then you're actually going to have to end up producing more force too. But also if you're just tired, your, your muscles are going to be able to produce less force. Um, and then also there are, there, there's, I'm going to talk about muscle hypertrophy and neurological changes. So if you make, if you make a muscle bigger, it's going to be able to produce more force. So it's going to be able to affect that, that force side of the equation for torque. Also, um, if you work on lifting heavier and heavier weight, there's going to be some other changes that happen in your body that don't necessarily relate just to, um, it's called morphological changes, so that don't necessarily relate to changes in muscle size. Um, there's, uh, in your tendon, there's a thing called, a, I won't quiz you on this, but there's a thing called a Golgi tendon organ. Um, and it senses when you're lifting or when you're moving something that you, you shouldn't be lifting, and it basically tells your body to stop. Um, heavy strength training can, can inhibit that response so that you can end up lifting more weights. Um, now if, if, if hypertrophy is morphological changes, uh, improving strength through lifting heavy things is called more neurological changes. So maybe you get better at recruiting, um, specific muscle fibers, or, um, when I talked about that impulse coming down from the motor neuron into the muscle fiber, um, it's called rate coding. So you actually improve the firing frequency, um, of that, of that signal to your muscle. So I'm going to pause the recording.